Hello everyone. After having just finished Betrayer, I wanted to come back and do a review on it, but also just kind of give my thoughts in general on the game. So the first part and the majority of this video is going to be very light on spoilers, so don't worry. Towards the end, I'm going to get into some spoilers, but I'll warn you in advance, so don't worry too much about it. So my overall impressions of this game is that it's a mixed bag, but I'm really glad I played it. It's pretty good. So, the setup for the game is basically this. It's set in the year 1604, and you sail, you have sailed to a Virginia colony, which is where I'm at right now, and you find that everything's, well, everything's pretty bad. <laughs> um, everything's corrupted, and there's spirits you have to converse with, and everything's gone wrong. People are, basically everybody's dead, for the most part. Everything's gone very, very wrong. You meet a very strange woman who doesn't remember her name, and you end up having to travel from settlement to settlement. This is the first settlement you come across. And you end up having to talk with the spirits of the people who used to live here and try to basically solve... Uh, help them remember what happened to lead to their deaths. Kind of help them pass on and come to accept their deaths, basically. So it is a first-person shooter kind of adventure game hybrid. Which is pretty neat. Oh yeah, and the graphics might be burning your retinas at the moment, by the way. Probably looks very, very harsh. Um, I'm going to talk about the graphics later, but suffice to say, this is the default settings for how everything looks as far as the color and the saturation and the harshness goes, and it can actually be changed. But I'm going to leave it on default because this is how the game is apparently meant to be played, and I'll address it later. So let's look at the core gameplay structure of the game. Let's look at what you do throughout almost the entirety of the game. So here's basically what you do. Like I said, you go from settlement to settlement, talking to the people, so let's do that. There's two different kind of... I guess you could say... worlds, or universes. There's the daylight, like this, normal. And then there's also kind of the... I don't know what you call it, the spirit world, the dark. Which you can access by... grabbing the bell. Each settlement, or at least each major settlement, will have a bell that you can put back on its post. You have to find the bell and then put it back. And then if you ring it, you will go into the other universe. And it's within here that you'll find the spirits. So let's go ahead and find one. Alright, there we go. I had to do some early game stuff. I've, I've just started a new game, so I kind of forgot about some of the early steps you have to do. But yes, so back to the main gameplay structure, what you do for most of the game. So, you go from settlement to settlement, you find the bell, you replace it, and you have to flip-flop between the normal world and this world that we're in now. And you have to find various things, like clues, and you also have to talk to the spirits to basically help them remember who they are and what happened. So here's a spirit, for example. So I've already talked to him, you talk to him, and then you have an ability to listen. I'm going to press it right now. You can hear some strange noises. So this strange ability to listen basically guides you to the next thing that you need to go to. You know, kind of a souped up, I don't know if you call it like a waypoint, a souped up sort of guide. It's not, it's not like a quest marker on your map or something like that. You know, you pull up your map, it doesn't tell you where to go. But it's it's a really well kind of implemented system to tell you where to go because it fits in with the story of what's happening and it's a bit more atmospheric because it's a very atmospheric game. Oh, some enemies just popped up. But yeah, it's a nice change of pace from just having somewhere on your map marked telling you where to go. You know, a quest marker. But instead of that, you have to actually listen. You have to press the button. And then you have to move around to try to locate it. Like, oh, okay, it's not here, it's not here. Oh, it's here. Until it's right in the center. So it's pretty cool. You have to pay attention, you have to listen to it. It's nice. Uh, this one is actually not a spirit. That's something completely different. It's kind of like an optional thing. You find these totems that are corrupted. And if you go near them, usually you have to fend off a bunch of enemies around it. And then you get some sort of a reward and you've kind of like cleansed the place of corruption. Also, these various chests you can find around here that have typically coin inside of them that you can spend at a store, but sometimes they'll also have equipment. Most of the time it's just coin, though. So let's try to just very, very 
briefly solve a little bit of the case to show you how it works. So let me go find another clue or another spirit. So I hear something behind me, but I also hear something this way. Yep, there we go. You can hear it this way. It's right about here. So again, nice little atmospheric sort of quest marker kind of thing. Probably going to find a spirit over here, I think. I'm just going to do this very briefly. Don't want to spoil too much. There it is. Let us speak with you. What has roused you from your slumber? I am sundered and cannot rest. Alright, this one is missing its head, or missing its skull. And then you have to go try to get it back. So, this is actually a fast travel system. I'm going to fast travel back to the main fort. Switch back to the daytime. can hear something in the distance over there, and that's pretty much how it works. So you go around, you talk to spirits, you know, some of them like need their skull back and you have to go get their skull. Uh, you have to get various clues. This is a marked grave, don't think that's too important. You have to dig up things that end up being clues that you can show to the spirits to show, to help them remember what happened. Somebody's trying to attack me. Where? 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 Oh, there you are. Stop shooting at me. My god, die. Okay, there we go. Oh, there's another one. Hold on a second. Technical difficulties. By technical difficulties, I mean arrow difficulties. Guess it shows a bit of the combat, huh? Pin cushions. Let me collect my arrows. There we go. Okay, so yes, that's actually what you spend the vast majority of your time doing. That's pretty much how... 95% of the game plays out. You go from settle you go you go to a settlement, you put the bell on, you just kind of listen for where to go. You press the button. Go, oh, okay, it's in that direction or whatever. You go over there, you dig up some clues, you talk to some spirits, you go back to the other world, and then you talk to some spirits there, you go back to the other world, you dig up some clues again, maybe. Go back to the other world, talk to some spirits, talk between spirits. And you end up being like the go-between to a bunch of spirits. Talking from one to the next to the next to the next, until you help them remember what happened to them, and then that's pretty much it. So that's the majority of the game right there. And of course, as you're going to collect these clues and stuff out in the world, and going to... as you're helping these people remember, you often encounter enemies like I just did there, and you end up having to shoot them. So those are the two parts of the FPS adventure game sort of hybrid part. The adventure game part is talking to the spirits. You're talking to them, you're collecting items that are clues, basically, to help them remember. You often find notes around. Let me find one. Um, where's the nearest one? There's one back here. Lots of glowing stuff, as I'm sure you can see. Yeah, here's a note. So you find a, little, a lot of notes that tell you more about the story, although I don't think any of them are actually required to progress, but... Yeah, they have some interesting uh, story elements to them. So that's the adventure game part, is the talking between people and collecting things and whatnot, and the FPS part is obviously when you encounter enemies out in the field and whatnot. Well, you have to kill them. So that's pretty much how the majority of the game plays out. So let's look at those two specific parts. Let's look at the adventure game part. And how strong it is. It's... Okay. It's decent. The story is... It's pretty interesting. You end up hearing their tales about... Well, let me just say it's a very depressing and disturbing game. Every tale basically involves... Murder and loss and... Sometimes even rape. So, it's a very disturbing game. You won't hear any happy tales, believe me. That's the strange woman that I met, by the way, who doesn't remember her name. Don't want to spoil anything about her, so I won't talk more about her. I'll just say that she's very important to the story. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh yes, so you learn about what has happened to these people, and it's usually very disturbing. And the story is... it's pretty good. You know, it's a decent story. I found it fairly engaging. But I think the biggest problem I had with the story and basically the adventure game sort of part of it is that the more gamey elements feel very out of place compared to the sort of more adventure game story-oriented part of the game. 
it ended up feeling a bit awkward. Let me heal here. You heal by drinking water. So yeah, no med packs. That's a nice thing. A nice little lack of gaminess there that I actually quite like. But yeah, I mean, there's like this. This is the store. So you find these stores, which aren't manned by actually anybody. There's nobody actually here. It's just a pile of equipment that the owner hopes you actually pay for, and of course you have no choice but to pay for it. And the further you progress in the game, these stores will have better and better equipment. So this first one has very weak stuff. You know, common musket, common longbow, shoddy longbow. Later on you'll find, like, quality or stuff like that. Quality or exceptional bows and muskets. So that, I mean, it works. Like, it works as far as a FPS sort of progression system. But it also feels very awkward compared to the story oriented adventure game part. And then there's other stuff like this, like you find these crates that you can break apart for loot. There's all these red chests around that make a noise that have typically money inside of them. This one had a charm. But this one's probably gonna have money, as they usually do. Oh, this one actually had a water skin. Never mind. But yes, they typically have money. So it feels very strange. There's this weird shop system which works, but it's weird. And then there's all of these glowing chests with gold inside of them around the world. And it's just weird stuff like that that makes the adventure game part feel a little bit at odds with everything else. It just feels strange. But the story itself is pretty good. It's pretty interesting. It just kind of sits awkwardly in the rest of the game. All right, that's the adventure game part. Let's look at the FPS part. So one thing I really like about this game is the fact that it's set in 1604 and all of your weaponry is appropriately made for the time. You know, you don't have any... <laughs> you don't have an AK-47, you don't have automatic rifles, obviously. You have bows and crossbows and uh, black powder guns, like this crude pistol, for example. So it leads to a very interesting combat, not only because your weapons just look and and feel different from the typical, typical weapons you have in, like, a modern military shooter, but also because they lead to very different combat. It's a much slower paced and deliberate combat where aiming is extremely important. Well, okay, maybe not extremely important, but it's very important. Because, because there's such slow traveling and slow reloading weapons, you have to be careful about how you aim. So your bow, for example, you really want to hit your enemy with the bow. Because if you miss, your bolts are going to go off who knows where, and you're going to have a hard time recovering them. If you hit all of them into the enemy, then you can just go up to the body and collect all of your arrows. So aiming is very important there. And also, of course, you can't shoot too fast. That's about as fast as you can shoot with this bow. So, you know, you want to take your time aiming. And it's even more important for black powder guns like this. Black powder guns do typically a heck of a lot more damage than bows do. However, you can't recover your rounds, of course. And they're also very slow to reload. You only get one shot, so let's look at this. Let's look at this enemy. I'm crouched, so he shouldn't be able to see me. So this pistol should take him out in one shot. Oh! I guess I need to hit him in the head. Alright, yeah, see, look at this reload time. Very slow. Took like two seconds to reload. One, two, maybe three seconds. Yeah, that's more like three seconds. And if I had hit him in the head, then he would have died in one shot. Since I didn't, I gave him time to shoot me. So it's it's a much more del deliberately placed, uh, paced and slower paced combat. That's it's a, it's a refreshing change. I quite like it. And then you have to kind of decide between do you want like a more of a one hit kill weapon like this, or do you want more bows where you can recover your ammo? So bows do less damage, but you can recover your ammo, and they're faster to shoot. So you're probably going to want to go for some sort of a mix where you have a weapon where you just, like, maybe maybe you shoot around with a black powder gun and then you switch to your bow, for example. So it's quite nice. Yeah, the FPS combat part is pretty solid. Although I do have some issues with it. My biggest issue is probably the sound design when it comes to combat. Let's actually talk about... Alright, yeah, let's talk about the sound design when it comes to combat and then the sound design in general. So my issue with the sound design when it comes to combat is that for an FPS to feel good when you're when you're shooting not just guns but just weapons of any sort when you're shooting gun weapons <laughs> I'm said guns again when you're shooting and using weapons for it to feel good 
you need quite a few things to be in place. You need good sound effects, right? It needs to sound good when you hit your enemies, and it needs to sound good when you're shooting or using your weapon of whatever sort. And you need good feedback from the enemy and stuff like that. And it needs to feel responsive, you know, things of that sort. So when it comes to the sound design, I feel like the sound design for the weapons is actually... Well, it's a mixed bag. The sounds of the black powder guns, like this pistol, for example, are actually quite good. I actually think that's really good. It's not the kind of over-exaggerated Hollywood sort of ridiculously beefed up gun sound. You know, it's... I'm not sure if it's completely realistic. I'm not really familiar with black powder gun sounds, but it certainly sounds authentic. Yeah, it sounds really good. But that's just the black powder guns. Chances are most of the time you're going to be using bows and arrows. And unfortunately the bows, of which there are a long bow, a short bow, and a crossbow, they don't really sound very good. Let me find some wood to shoot my arrows into so I don't lose them all. <laughs> Alright, let's shoot into the wall. Oh, why did that deflect? It's kind of bugging out. Maybe I should shoot something else. Let me shoot this barrel. There we go, that should be better. So yeah, just have a listen. I don't know about you, but to me, it just doesn't sound very good. It feels very weak and very light. It doesn't feel good to shoot. Like, when I think of using a bow, I don't know if it's realistic. It probably isn't. But when I think of what sounds cool when shooting a bow, what sounds good, what sounds satisfying, I want to hear like a more of a wood sound and definitely more of a twang, you know? Like the thoo thoo as you're shooting. As you're releasing, rather. Now, this is probably a pretty realistic sound, I would imagine. But I like authenticness in the sounds. But at the same time, I'll take a little bit of a, a little bit of unrealisticness, I guess you could say. If it means a much better sounding bow. It just sounds really weak. It doesn't sound great, which doesn't make it feel good to use, to be honest. And similarly, the sounds that you hear when you end up actually hitting enemies with it is also not terribly satisfying. Let's go find an enemy again. And I should stress that bows like this, are probably what you're going to be using most of the time for enemies. So, it's not like this is something you can just not really use. You're probably going to be using it most of the time. Let's find an enemy. I hear a twinkling chest. There it is. I know there's more enemies up the road here. There's one, or... Oh, never mind, that was the barrel. But no, there's one. There's a bunch of enemies. Okay. Ow. Big guy's throwing stuff at me. Anyway, you can hear the sounds. It just, like, it's it's twanging off of the armor and all of that, but it just doesn't sound great. I'm actually out of arrows at this point, so I only I have no choice but to use the pistol. Oh, come on. These starting game weapons are really bad. Oh, God. Oh, God. Tomahawk. Tomahawk. There we go. But yeah, you heard that, right? Like, I just shot him in the face with a black powder gun, and it made, like, no sound at all. It just went, like, pling, and they fell on the ground. So it's not just the uh, bow and arrow that doesn't have really good reaction sounds when you're hitting an enemy, but it's it's all the weapons. So, black powder guns sound good to fire. Bows and arrows and crossbows and whatnot don't sound good to fire, and none of the weapons really sound particularly good when they hit. There's not a lot of good feedback in the sounds, so it ends up with the combat feeling... Not all that great. It feels okay, but it just doesn't feel nearly as meaty 
as it should. Which is unfortunate. So now let's talk about the sound design in general, not, not just combat. Outside of combat, it's actually quite good. It's actually very good. With the particular highlight being with the nature sounds. Let's actually go back here. Particular highlight on the nature sounds and the wind sounds and stuff like that. So just the sounds of being out in the forest. Like the beat of this flag. Hearing it flopping in the wind, rustling. Sounds really good. The sound of the wind, which should happen any second now. Yeah, just listen to all these uh, birds and insects and stuff. Like, it sounds it sounds alive. It feels like the forest is alive because of the sound, which is great. And then the wind should come any second. There we go. So yeah, combat sounds not great, but nature sounds really, really good. Birds and insects and wind. It's wonderful. So there's sort of the mixed bag aspect of the game again. So, let's talk about the graphics. I was talking about how it looked really... The game looks very harsh, and I was going to talk about that later, so let's talk about that right now. This is how the game looks like by default. However, you can change it very, very, very dramatically. So, if you go here into the options, color and uh, contrast and color settings, this is default. And you can change the dark intensity, light intensity, and color saturation. So, I want to stress, this is how the game is by default. So... This is how apparently the developers intended you to play it. However, I find it eye-searingly horrible. N not that, I mean, like, the harshness of it. it. It feels atmospheric, right? But it's just the simple problem of it really hurts, like it actually hurts my eyes to look at because the contrast is ridiculously high. It's just painful to look at. It's just so harsh. So, for most of my playthrough, when I play through it, I actually turned down the harshness quite a bit. Let's see. I set it to something more like... I'm not quite sure what I had it at. Something more like that. Where it's still black and white, for the most part. You know, there's some things that are in color. Enemies and chests and that flag and whatnot. But I just turned down the harshness of it because it's frankly just way too harsh to look at. It's just really hard to look at. So, I'm glad that they put in the option to change it. And by the way, you can even change it to full color. Oh my god, that's maybe a little bit too colorful. Um, uh, five. let's see... Let me change this to something pretty good. Something that looks kind of realistic, I suppose. There, that looks, yeah, that looks pretty realistic. Too saturated, actually. Closer. Still a little bit strange, but yeah, for the most part, this is kind of how you'd expect it to look in a normal game. So you can very dramatically change how the game looks. So I really like that they put that option in there. However, I want to stress again, the way the game looks by default is eye-searing. And that's apparently how they intend you to play the game, because that's how they start you off. And I'm really a big... I guess you could say I'm a big... believer in... experiencing art, how the artist intended it to be experienced. So for movies, for example, I always want to see the kind of, you know, the unrated director's cut. You know, whatever the director wanted me to see is what I want to see. Same with games. However the developers want me to play the game, however they want me to experience it, is how I want to experience it. So in this case, they want me to experience it looking like this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's just too painful to look at. So I find that very awkward. That the way the game starts out and the way you're intended to experience it is painful. Literally painful to look at. It actually hurts my eyes and I want to look away. You shouldn't have to change that to make it, you know, look more reasonable. It's very strange. It just feels very awkward. It's, it's almost as if I'm making my own director's cut of the game for myself which is at odds with wanting to experience it how with how the developers intended. So it just feels very awkward and very strange. But again, there is options available, so... You can change it, that's quite nice. Now, let's talk about the visual fidelity and the rest of the graphics, not just the color and whatnot. So let's turn it back to being kind of realistic-looking. 
Um, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it's decent. So the visual fidelity of the game is actually quite good. Yeah, I mean, texture resolutions are pretty decent. Some nice... Those are actually 3D. I was going to say they're like normal mapping or bump mapping or whatever, but I think those are actually 3D. They're rocks. Not sure. Either way, uh, yeah, it looks quite good. I mean, texture resolutions are pretty good. Everything's uh, pretty damn well detailed. The Definitely the highlight of the graphics is the vegetation. As you can see, there's a lot of it. I know YouTube is going to ruin how everything looks because of compression, so let me stay still. There we go. It should look okay now. Yeah, look at it blowing the wind. The way the vegetation looks is really impressive, especially just all these different varieties of trees, the way they blow in the wind, the bushes, the grass. There's a lot of vegetation, and it looks really great, and that's definitely the standout of the graphics. If we go back to the fort... Oh, everything's, you know, pretty good looking. There's not a lot of interactivity in the world. You can't really, like, push around objects. They don't really have physics for the most part. Can't really break or modify any much of the environment. But it's a pretty good looking game. And it runs decently. Not amazingly. You know, right here it's running just fine. It's running at at least 60 FPS. I have noticed some parts of the game, for some reason, run at actually sub-60. Which is strange, because... I've got a pretty powerful GPU. Uh, I've got a GeForce 770 4 gig edition. Which is pretty damn powerful. And while this game looks good, it doesn't look amazing. So I was kind of... I definitely think it could be better optimized. I don't feel like it should be going below 60. But nonetheless, it runs pretty good, and it looks pretty damn good as well. Okay, what else? Alright, so let me kind of wrap up. So I've talked about the main... The main gameplay of traveling from settlement to settlement, collecting the bell, talking to the spirits, collecting clues and all of that, fighting enemies in between. There's the adventure and the FPS parts kind of coming together. One of the problems I have, though, is that none of the two kind of main feelings of the game, the first-person shooter and the adventure, uh, neither of them really feel particularly strong. None of them are bad. But as I talked about with the shooting, it doesn't feel great, it just feels kind of decent. Sometimes a little, way too light in the amount of feedback you get and how the weapons feel when you shoot them. And the tactical possibilities when it comes to enemies and how to fight them is... It's not very interesting, to be honest. I mean, for the most part, you just kind of run around. I mean, okay. Let me talk about this. The developers obviously intended you to be able to play a very stealthy character and to sneak around and attack enemies by surprise. And the reason I say this is for a couple reasons. Let me check and check my inventory. Okay, I don't have one, but you see this crew charm of soldiery. Uh, reloads muskets, pistols, and crossbows 5% faster. Well, there's a charm that allows you to... It increases your stealth, basically. makes you harder to see and harder to hear. Also, another advantage to bows compared to pistols is that if you look over here... Uh, crap, I can't point to it. Okay, well, if you look at the stats on the right, damage, range, speed, deflect chance... Under special, it says stealthy. And that's because bows, because they're, you know, pretty much silent, are, well, you can use them as a stealthy weapon. If you're hiding and you take out an enemy, there's a pretty good chance that an enemy nearby is not going to know where you are. If they see that you, if they see their comrade fall down, then they might kind of go on alert status, but they're not going to go towards you because they don't know where you are. So, you have a stealthy weapon, you have charms that increase your stealth, uh, there's also the fact that when the wind blows, it actually masks sounds. So you could kind of like sprint towards an enemy when the wind starts blowing to get up close to them and they'll and the the wind will mask your sound. So there's all of these elements in there that obviously mean you're encouraged to use stealth. However, in reality, you really don't need to at all, because this game is actually really damn easy. It's maybe a little bit challenging at the beginning when you don't quite know what you're doing. But a little bit later on, you get much better equipment. And you can take out enemies very easy. And there's, the combat is just... It's very simple. It's very simple combat. You know, hit them in the head for more damage. Hit them in the body for less. If you hit them in the head while you're in stealth, you kind of I think you get even more of a bonus to damage. And you can usually take them out in one hit. Uh, if you're stealthed and you melee them from the back, I believe that pretty much guarantees a kill. 
And that's pretty much it. So enemies kind of pop up. You might hide behind a tree to avoid their projectiles and to avoid getting shot. So, you know, they're shooting at you. You come out and, like, shoot an arrow, hide behind, shoot an arrow, hide behind. And that's pretty much it. The combat is really not very difficult at all. And you end up having to run back and forth to find clues and to talk between spirits that you end up, at least I ended up, getting moderately impatient. And I just, like, the thought of going through the world crouched, scared of enemies that weren't even really a threat, just seemed ridiculous. So I ended up sprinting everywhere and just, like, jumping and bunny hopping and stuff, <laughs> which is the opposite of stealth. And any enemy within, like, a mile will hear you, but the thing is, it didn't matter because they're so easy. The game does have difficulty options, of course. However, the default setting is Deadly Enemies. So there's basically Easy, Deadly Enemies is basically the medium, and then there's Hard. I had it on Deadly Enemies, which is the default. I also turned on You Drop Your Loot at Death, which was off by default, so that added extra stakes to the world. However, even with the default setting of Deadly Enemies, and setting the Loot Drop option on, I actually never died, ever, once. I played this game for like seven to eight hours, I think, and I never died once. Occasionally I got close, but I never died. It's really damn easy. You don't need to worry about stealth. You can just run through like a jackass. It's very strange. So there's these elements of stealth, but they don't feel like they really matter. And the combat is fairly simplistic. And the AI is definitely very simple as well. They basically just run at you and shoot you with arrows or rocks in the case of that big guy, or they melee you if they get super close. And that's pretty much it. They run at you and they shoot whatever they have. And that's pretty much it for the combat. It gets a little bit challenging towards the very end, kind of, because they just end up throwing a lot of enemies at you. But pretty simple, not very challenging. So that doesn't feel particularly satisfying. So, and the adventure game uh, part of it also doesn't feel particularly satisfying. For reasons I mentioned previously about kind of sitting at odds with the FPS part. And also the fact that, frankly, the game gets really repetitive. Let's go back to the fort. It gets very repetitive. I mentioned that collecting the bell and talking to the spirits and helping them figure out what happened to them is pretty much 95% of the game. And that's exactly true. That's what you do. Like, look, uh, look at the world map. Okay, these aren't filled in, but there's a location here, 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 here. There's like five plus more locations. Different forts and different settlements. And every time you go to a new location, you do the same thing. You find the bell, you put it on, you talk to the spirits, you press the listen key. Like that. You go towards the source of the sound, you might fight some enemies along the way, collect something, collect some clues, talk to some spirits, go back and forth, you know, fast travel back to the town, bring the clues you found to the spirits, and then just go back and forth in between the dark and the light world, listening for something. Always listening until you finish the location, and then rinse and repeat. And that's pretty much the entire game. So it ends up feeling very repetitive, and it ends up feeling very mechanical. It's kind of like... I mean, it's moderately satisfying in a sort of... RPG, skyrim -y kind of... checking another quest off your list sort of thing. You know, there's another spirit investigation that I've solved. But it doesn't feel very interesting, because you're just doing the same thing again and again. It's like a massive fetch quest. Collect this clue, collect that clue, talk to that person, talk to that person, collect this clue, talk to that person, back and forth and back and forth, and fighting enemies in between. It just doesn't feel particularly interesting, and it's very repetitive. And it weakened my interest in the more adventure game parts of it and the story elements because, because of how mechanical and how repetitive it was. Even though what they were saying, what these spirits were communicating to me about their lives and what had happened to them was, you know, tragic and disturbing and well-written, for the most part. It, it just was hard not to find it kind of... Oh god, I'm stuck. <laughs> this is like the third time in the game I've been stuck between rocks. Anyway, I'll get out eventually. It uh, It's just very repetitive. And that kind of mind-numbing repetition made it hard to really feel particularly engaged by a lot of the story. Get me out of here, jeez. I guess I'll just fast travel. So... The FPS part felt decent, but not great. The adventure game part felt decent, but again, not great. So, that's the mixed bag part. The game is itself a, a mix of genres. But 
neither major genre that it kind of fits into really feels particularly well executed. It's just decent. So that's pretty much it. It's a mixed bag, you know? It's pretty good. The combat's decent, the, the story's decent, it's pretty creepy. Let's go back to the, uh, how I played through most of the game. Something like... Yeah, something like that. It's kind of how I, how I play through the game. You know, it's pretty creepy, it's pretty atmospheric. You face some very strange creatures. That are rather disturbing. You hear some very disturbing tales. It's a very dark game. Kind of literally and figuratively speaking. And uh, it's nice. It's something different from what I'm used to. It's got... Like I said, it's creepy. Um, it's got a very nice open world sort of design. It's by no means in any way a corridor shooter or a corridor anything. It's very open world. You're, well, out in the open. Amongst the grass grass uh, amongst the forest, listening to the wind, listening to that sound to find where you're supposed to go next. You know, there's a lot of freedom, which I like. And it's decent. Yeah. It's a pretty good game. But it's definitely a mixed bag. Alright, so that's the end of the main kind of review part. Now I kind of want to get into my more spoilerific general thoughts on the game. So if you're worried about spoilers, definitely turn around now. Because the train is going to go to Spoiler Town in 3, 2, 1. Okay, let's get into spoilers. So, about the story. This is going to be pretty brief. I don't feel like I have too much to say about the story. I, I honestly feel like somebody who knows a lot more about history would be able to say a lot more about the story and kind of understand it a lot better because this obviously involves a lot of well I mean it's a settlement it involves uh, Indians and Spaniards and colonizing places and whatnot things like that which are obviously things that actually have happened <laughs> of course and there's a lot of uh, prejudices and issues that arose from that that obviously a lot of history touches on. However, I'm extraordinarily ignorant of history. Really, my history knowledge, despite having taken, you know, a couple history courses, of course, high school and college and whatnot, my history knowledge is still almost non-existent. Nearly non-existent, I'm not even joking. So I feel like somebody who actually knew more about history, more about this time period, around 1604, and more of the kind of general issues that were happening. I feel like somebody that knew more about that could say a lot more about the story. But there's one big thing I wanted to touch on that I just found really interesting about the game. And that's kind of the title of the game, I suppose. And sort of the concept that unfolds from that. So the game is called Betrayer. And before I finished it, I was actually wondering what the title meant. You know, I was thinking, alright, I'm like four hours into the game or whatever. What is Betrayer mean? Like, who who betrayed whom? What kind of betrayal are we talking about? You know, I couldn't connect that to any of the concepts that I've seen in the game so far before I finished it. And then as I got towards the end of the game, I realized what the title had come from. It's a betrayer. It's talking about talking about Allison. Or right here, Allison's father. And how was it was her was her mother involved too or was it just her father? I think it was mostly her father. But yeah, it's about how her father betrayed her and betrayed especially betrayed Tabitha or Tabitha. I'm going to say Tabitha, whatever. <laughs> it's about how he betrayed her and killed her. Literally killed her in a horrible disgusting way. Killed her and her child because of the shame of it because she disgraced their family by sleeping with the savages as they're called that's the betrayal or at least that's one of the betrayals I suppose Allison herself is kind of a betrayal given the twist ending but I'm not really going to go into that and I just found it very interesting because when you first find Tabitha she's she's tied to a post okay I'm going to stop fidgeting around with my character hold on 
Probably looks terrible because of YouTube compression, so let me get more stationary. There we go. So you find her tied to a post. Naked. Burned or burning. I mean, she was burned previously, but she's still kind of burning because it's like her spirit or something. I don't know, whatever. Yeah, she's burned, naked, tied to a post. With her throat slashed. Like, that's really disturbing. Not only is she dead, but she's dead in a very disturbing way. And I saw that and I thought, you know, that's... What? That's... That's savage. <laughs> that's savagery. That's something savages would do. It's uncivilized. It's fucked up. It's horrible. And then you learn... That it's actually her own father that did that to her. Her own father took her to the savages, basically, and did that to her. And basically said to the savages... This is how we treat people that, you know, interact with you, basically. Who dirty themselves by being around you, the savages. This is how we treat them. Sending a message. And I just found that very powerful. The idea that the so-called savages are, well... Either not, or at least not the only, savages. Because her father... I mean, her father... A you know, father is supposed to protect your children. And more than that, this father is part of the civilized people, you know? They live in settlements. They're not like the savages. They're civilized. They have their civilized morals and their civilized marriages. And all of that. <laughs> They're the civilized people. But there's multiple kinds. Of, there's two, I guess, two big types of betrayals there. One is they're supposedly civilized people. But he had done one of the most savage, disgusting things possible, and also he's a father who did that to his daughter. Which is also another betrayal of his duty to protect his children. And I just found that very powerful. That kind of almost reversal, I suppose. That the real savages are the civilized people. And, I mean, it's not just, it's not just her father. He's the most obvious and clear-cut example, I suppose. But all these spirits that you talk to around here, a lot of them have done horrible things. They've murdered people or raped people. Very, very disturbing things. And these are just, once again, these are the civilized people. But look at what they've done. They're not fucking civilized. They're monsters. They're murdering people for, for jealousy. For just pride. You know, this person insulted me, called me a coward, so I'm going to murder them. Just lying and cheating and murdering and... It's horrible. And these are the supposedly civilized people. I just thought that was very powerful. Very interesting. It's something that I've never seen really explored in a game before. So, I really enjoyed it. That part of it. As much as you can enjoy something extremely disturbing like that. <laughs> Not sure if enjoyed is the right word, but found it interesting is probably a better choice of words. Alright, so that's all I wanted to say about the story. And there ends my video. Alright, well, I hope you found this interesting, and thank you for watching.